Hello and welcome to Noel's Retro Lab Nibble Edition. Today we have the board for a ZX Spectrum 128K Toast Rack Invistronica Edition that isn't working. I believe it's a fairly common fault, so let's diagnose it and fix it quickly. I think this will help a lot of you trying to fix your own ZX Spectrums at home. So Daniel Carretero sent me this uh, board of a ZX Spectrum 128K, the Investronica edition. And I don't normally do repairs for other people unless it's something exceptional, but this was apparently his childhood computer that stopped working. And the 128K Spectrum, it's somewhat rare. So I'd hate for one to go to waste and it feels very satisfying to bring them back to life. So let's see if we can fix Daniel's um, Spectrum. I'm not going to get into the history of the computer. If you're interested in that, check out the link in the corner. I have some other videos in which I talk in more detail about what made the 128K and Vestronica one different from other computers. So Daniel mentioned that this computer was working fine just a few weeks ago, and he went to plug in something and then stopped working. And he was getting garbage video on the screen. So he probably connected something while this was plugged in. It's a very, very common failure on ZX Spectrums. And I'm guessing because of that and because of the bad video out that one of the transistors involved in the voltage generation circuitry especially the 12 volt line was blown so before we even plug it in and see what kind of video out we get i'm going to do my usual check and turn it on while connected to a bench power supply to see if there is enough current draw or if there's a short or anything like that so wait oh <laughs> right uh, we're getting no current draw because this is unplugged from the case and it doesn't have the voltage regulator. So I need to put a 7805 in here to be able to test this. So for now, I'm just going to put it straight like this without even attaching it to a heat sink. Hopefully this will be good enough to last for the 30 seconds that we need to test um, things. But I've had bad experiences in the past with them. The voltage started dropping as soon as the temperature goes up. So we'll just need to watch out for that. Okay, let's try that again. If everything is working normally, I expect to have about 800 milliamps of current draw. And okay, that's a little low maybe, but at least we're not maxing out the current, which is what happens if we have a bad, bad short. So things look reasonable and consistent with my initial theory that maybe one of those transistors is bad. If so, it may not be generating 12 volts, which is going to cause the current draw to be lower. So let's check it out on a TV now. I want to avoid any potential problems with the RF out. So I'm going to hook up directly my RGB cable that I know it's already working. So we should be able to get the best image quality possible. And that's what I expected from what Danielle had mentioned before. So yeah, let's try to fix that. So the main reason I'm still thinking that the problem is with the voltage generation circuitry is because when there's something really wrong with the video signal coming out, that signal is generated by the panel encoding chip, in this case is a T2000. And that chip is one of the few on the board and that requires the 11 or 12 volt um, input and that's the voltage that is generated over there with tr4 and tr5 so let's just measure what kind of voltage the t2000 is getting just gonna get ground right there and it should be pin 11 it should be this one and yeah there you go instead of getting 12 we're getting 1.4 so clearly that's not right i'm not going to get into the details of the voltage generating circuitry because we already saw that in a previous video. Again, I'm putting up a link over there so you can check it out. But um, the important thing to know is that the main parts involved in that are these two transistors, TR4 and TR5, as well as some of those capacitors and diodes and then this coil in here. Normally, this is a very, very common failure. TR4 um, blows up very easily whenever there's a short somewhere, usually by plugging something incorrectly on the um, expansion board, for example, while the computer is on. To be able to test if a transistor is working correctly, we need to know a little bit what's going on inside. So there are two major kinds of transistors that we're going to see in these kinds of circuits, NPN transistors and PNP transistors. For now, let's just focus on the NPN transistors. 
Transistors have different junctions inside, and NPN means that it has a negative, positive, negative junction. It's helpful to think of a diode when thinking about transistors. A diode has one junction, and current flows from the positive end to the negative end, and it has a voltage drop, usually around 0.7 volts at the same time. For testing purposes, we could think of an NPN transistor as two diodes. And because it's an NPN, the diodes are set up in this way. So the positive ends are together and they're going off in two different negative ends, kind of mimicking the layout of the transistor itself. So we expect current to flow from the positive end to the negative end on both ends. So the current is gonna flow from the base to the collector and the base to the emitter. And in each case, it's going to have a slight voltage drop, somewhat similar to a diode. And current supposedly will not flow the other way from the emitter to the base or the collector to the base. In the case of a PNP transistor, it's exactly the same thing, except that the junctions are reversed. So again, the current flows from positive to negative. So current will flow from the emitter to the base and collector to the base, having a slight voltage drop, but not the other way around. So we can use that to see if a transistor is working correctly. So let's use that technique to start testing TR4. I'm gonna set the multimeter in diode measuring mode. So there you go. So tier four is an NPN. So we should see a about 0.6 volt drop from the center out because that's where from the base out to the emitter. So if I put the positive lead in the base and I check here, that's that's a big voltage drop, but that's that's within reason. And then here we oh a short. Yeah, that's pretty much a short. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that a short is always bad because it could be something else on the board that is you know, having a, a path that there's no voltage drop. To test it for real, we should take it out and test it in isolation without being connected to anything. But it's, I don't think, I mean, you can compare it to another one and I don't think that's the correct voltage drop in there. And now let's do the opposite. Let's put the negative lead in the middle and then we should be having pretty much no, it should be an, an open circuit. And let's see, that's a one volt drop. Again, this is probably going through somewhere else on the board. And from there to there, again, I suppose it could be somewhere else on the board, but I don't recall those readings in other spectrums. Let's try TR5 now. So TR5 is a PNP. So we're going to put the negative lead in the middle and positive on the, okay, 0.6, perfect. And then on the emitter or collector, 0.6. Okay, that's textbook, perfect. And now, assuming this was disconnected from the board, we should see no connectivity at all. So one, so yeah, this is probably going through something else. And I believe this should give no, okay, one. The one that stands out to me as really bad is the short between the base and the, whatever it is, the emitter or the collector in tier four. And tier four is the one that fails most of the time. So it's only three leads. Let's take it out and let's measure it by itself. And then we'll for sure know if it's working or not. So there it is. Now let's test it by itself. So as a reminder, TR4 is an NPN transistor. So current should flow from the base in the middle to the um, emitter and collector. And I just put this tip here, hoping to hold it in place a little bit. Wow, so we are getting no connectivity at all from the base to that end. And from the base to this other one, that's an open circuit. So that is really dead. And now let's try it this way. Now this, sh this should be no voltage drop, like the no connectivity from the base to the emitter or collector, I forget which one it is. Yeah, so that's correct. And from here to here, okay, another short. So it's really busted. One of them is a short and the other one is completely open. It could not be more destroyed than that. And as you can see, the readings are different than what we got on the board, because in the board, we were actually reading the path of least resistance to get a voltage drop. So here it's very clear that this is totally busted. 
as I said, this happens so much on ZX Spectrums that I have my whole bag full of equivalent transistors to that one. That was a ZTX650, these are ZTX651, same thing. So let's put in one of the new ones. I usually bend the legs a little bit to open them up so they fit on the board. Push it out a little bit in there, and there, and then I push them like that. And then normally you can follow the markings on the board and they show you how the transistor goes because transistors usually have a flat side and a rounded side. So it tells you to put it this way, but I like to check it because oftentimes that is incorrect. And then sometimes there are equivalent transistors that switch around the bit, the collector and the emitter. So it's never a bad idea to double check that. So from the data sheet, looking at the front of the transistor, this should be collector, base, and emitter. So if you follow the markings on the board, the transistor would fit this way, so the emitter would be on the top hole. And to make sure that that's correct, I checked the schematics for the board, and the emitter of TR4 should be connected to ground. So it's a very easy check. I see if there's connectivity there. Perfect. So that matches what the board says, which is always a good thing. I've seen some recommendations in the past that if they say if you replace TR4, you should also replace TR5. That has honestly not been my experience. I've seen plenty of blown TR4s and there was no need whatsoever to replace TR5. But we're going to run some measurements right now. And if we're not getting the right 12 volts, then I'll probably look at TR5 closely. So let's test again pin 11 of the T2000. And there we go, 11.4 volts. That's plenty fine for what we need. I bet we have a good video image out. Now, there could be some other problem, but we'll find out now. Well, we fixed the image quality, but the spectrum is clearly not working. Let's plug in a diagnostics ROM and see if we get any more information. Now, it looks just as dead, which in itself tells us some information. So from what we saw, I think the main suspect is a busted Z80 because we saw a really stable image on the screen, so the PAL chip is probably fine. And that garbage we're seeing in the screen is actually generated by the ULA, so that's, I suspect that it's probably fine. When that happens, and especially the fact that the um, extra diagnostic ROM would not work either, I'm suspecting it's a Z80. And there's some pretty easy ways to test if it's working or not, if it's alive. Um, so let's start with memory request. Is this one here? Here, that one looks totally fine. Read. So that looks a little low. It's only three volts high, but okay. Nothing in right in this weird indeterminate. Yeah, that, that's not looking good. And then the ones that are really usually the very obvious if it's working or not are M1 and refresh. That's 27 and 28. So this is M1, and that looks horrible. Now, there is some Z80 CPU, especially on Sinclair Spectrums, that have a busted M1, and everything is fine. But refresh should definitely be working, and another one that is that. So, yeah, we can safely say, well, not safely. There's nothing always, <laughs> there's nothing totally safe to look at the output signals of one chip and decide that is busted because it could be something else that is holding that signal down, but I'm gonna bet the Z8 is bad. So let's replace it, socket it, and try something else. So let's put a new Z80, and as usual, let's see if we get 
those signals that we were expecting before M1 and refresh. Okay, so let's start with read like we did before. Okay, write, that's better than before. I don't think before we're getting a, any kind of activity in the write. And then this should be M1, there we go. That's what I would expect. And refresh, also exactly what I would expect. So that is certainly much better than it was before. Maybe this is still not working. Maybe there's some blown um, RAM chips, but let's give it a try. There's a chance that maybe everything is working already. And well, it looks different, but it's definitely not working. Let's try with the diagnostics ROM again. Now it looks about, wait, hang on. Actually, this looks like the diagnostics ROM is starting to run. It's just that we're seeing mostly garbage in the screen, but you can tell that by the borders and those patterns that it's getting there. Yeah, it's definitely running the ROM. And this screen tells us that it managed to execute, but apparently every RAM chip failed. So there are definitely some things going very wrong in here. Wow, so much for this being a nipple edition of our video. I guess I should have known that there was something else wrong other than the 12 volt rail because not only were we not having a very good image, but the image that we saw was not the basic prompt. It was some kind of a garble thing. So maybe I should have figured that the Z80 was wrong or the ROM or something. But what I didn't expect is that after we fixed the Z80, it would still not be working. So let's keep digging into this and see what else is wrong with it. Okay, so the next best thing to do, I think, is going to be to look at the buses because it's clear that the Z80 is running right now and it's running the ROM, but it's clearly failing all the tests and also the ULA is not able to display a correct video image. So reading and or writing from RAM seems to be not working correctly at the moment. So it could be because all or most of the chips are blown, the RAM chips. It could also be the this chip over here. It's a ZX8401. It's a custom chip in which they do uh, some of the address demultiplexing and addressing for the multiple banks. Before it used to be discrete logic in earlier ZX Spectrum, the 48K versions before the issue six. Now it's all combined in this particular chip. You know, so it could be those things. It could also be something else that is interfering with the buses themselves. So like it could be a bad ROM that it's constantly shorting a data bit. So that's why I wanna have a quick look at the address and data buses first. And if that looks okay, then we'll see what, we're, what we look at next. Okay, so let's start with the address bus on directly in the Z80. So that looks great. Yep. So a fair amount of activity. Waves look pretty square. So they only go to like three volts, but that's probably fine. Yep. Oh, there's a clock, right? That's fine. Yeah. The address bus seems to be Mostly okay. So those are fine. Now let's look at the data bus. Ugh. Now you would think that looks pretty horrible and actually it does look pretty horrible. <laughs> but if I remember correctly from other spectrums and not just the 128K ones, just regular spectrums, the data bus kind of looks like that. Um, I'm not sure why it looks so bad, but that's not unusual. So obviously those bits are probably ignored and those are just very slowly charging waves, but it doesn't look any more unusual than normal. Yeah. And then more data bus, yep. Oh, man, that looks horrible, but yeah, I don't think there's something, I don't think there's anything faulty in this board that is causing that. So the data bus looks ugly, but within reason and the address bus looks totally fine. I don't think anything is majorly shorting the data buses. 
Also, uh, you can't see it right here, but I'm seeing on the bench power supply that we're drawing 0 0.8, even 0.79 milliamps. So there isn't a major, major short, or we would be seeing slightly higher current draw. In that case, maybe the easiest thing to check, since none of the memories are socketed and this chip is not socketed, maybe the best thing to check is to take this ULA, because that could be a problem with the ULA as well. The ULA is in charge of doing some of the logic for the reading and stuff, especially for video memory. We could put this ULA on a working 128K, and at least we can rule that out for sure if that's working. And this is the 128K from my own collection, and this one is working perfectly fine. So let's take out the ULA here and put the other one. Okay, this one came out much more easily. So looking at the codes there, they were actually, so this was made towards the later half of 1985. And same thing here. This one was week 36. This was one week 40. They look pretty different. They must have been made at different factories. Okay, let's try this. Well, it's technically working, but the image quality looks horrible. It looks like there's a ghosting effect. Really, really severe. So... Maybe part of the ULA is defective. So that was with RGB out. I also tried RF out, which is usually much worse quality. And surprise, surprise, this actually looks totally fine for an RF out. So maybe that ULA is very slightly defective and outputs slightly different RGB levels or something that throws off the RGB out, but actually works completely normally through RF out. So that's a little surprising, but at least it's not completely gone. For now, I'm going to put the ULA from the other computer that we know is completely working here. That way, we know the other one has some problems with the video, but it could also have problems with something else. So I just want to eliminate possibilities of things going wrong. So we're going to put this here and continue the repair. OK, so it's clear that the RAM is failing in some way, so it's probably all of the RAM chips, or just about all of them, or this custom chip over here. If you noticed on my own ZX Spectrum 128K, I pretty much have them all socketed, including this one, because that one had a, an epic repair as well a few years ago. So I think the easiest thing for now would be to take out this chip and put it on the other 128K and see if that one works. If that works, then we're really looking at a major RAM failure. Great, it's not working. That's very good news because we know for sure now that that chip was faulty. So let's put the one that is working on the board we're repairing and see if that works. And yeah, it looks like the basic for the ZX Spectrum comes up right away. Awesome. Everything seems to be working, but let's just run the diagnostics test just in case. Oh, so there was a problem after all. I'm honestly not that surprised. There were so many things wrong with this board that one RAM chip failing, it seems almost expected. Okay, let's go ahead and replace it. Looking at the web page for the diagnostics ROM, which by the way is excellent, tells us that when bit seven fails on a 128K ZX Spectrum, it's IC13. So this is IC13. Let's replace it and see if that fixes it. Will this be the last of the problems on this board? Let's see if that fixes it. Well, that didn't work at all. Yeah, it actually made it worse. What's going on? Let's run it again. 
and now all of the RAM chips fail? What is going on? So I did some more tests. I put back the original RAM chip and I started getting similar failures of all the RAM chips. So this might be related to some of that really ugly data bus we saw at the very beginning when we we're looking with the oscilloscope. And one thing that is connected to the data bus that is socketed is the ROM. So let's take the ROM out and see what happens. Interesting. So the lower RAM tests all pass. And now, of course, it gets stuck not identifying the ROM because there's no ROM in the board. Eventually, it just moves on and checks 48K and everything seems to pass. So it seems that that ROM was affecting the data bus probably and not allowing things to work properly. Let's put in the ROM that is working from the other computer and run that test again. And yeah, this time everything passes. Wow. So that was unusual. Normally when things fail, they just fail the same way. This was just sometimes failing one way, sometimes failing another way, not failing completely. So that made it a little harder to diagnose. And this is everything that was wrong with that ZX Spectrum. Poor, poor ZX Spectrum. The transistor tier four, the Z80 CPU, the ZX 8401, um, custom chip for memory demultiplexing. The ULA is not perfect. It's kind of working, but it's not perfect. And the ROM. So we're going to pause for now since we got it working, but we'll come back to this spectrum and we'll try to replace some of this. So, you know, the Z80, we just put any one, there's nothing to do, and the transistor as well. But this might be an interesting replacement. This one will just burn an EEPROM, so that's not a big deal. In the ULA, it seems mostly functional, so at least I want to look at it and see if there's something we can do to make it usable. But we'll do that next time. And we finally got it working. Wow, poor computer. I wonder what happened to it. It just had one thing after another after another. But it's a very special computer, and it was worth fixing it and getting it back to life. So. I hope you enjoyed the video. If so, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Until next video, see you then.